In any civilization, conflict is normally a given. This was especially true for the ancient civilization of Mesopotamia, particularly at a time when military campaigns became increasingly more common amongst the various cities. The gods themselves would play a significant role within these conquests, often fueling warriors with their divine spirit and inspiring kings and leaders to commit to city-wide skirmishes. With the presence of the gods, soldiers could shake their inhibitions and anxieties in battle, and the promise of victory or glory would see them go above and beyond for their respective kings. One such god that was frequently called upon in these times of battle was Ninurta, the god of war. Having been invoked by several Mesopotamian kingdoms for protection, might, and military strategy, Ninurta certainly gained a reputation as the deity who oversaw the battle and lent his strength to the highest bidder, or in this case, the more devoted. Yet, Ninurta was not always seen as a deity who whispered battle plans to commanders, or who riled up the soldiers with divine morale, or who got his hands dirty by lending his strength to one side over the other. In fact, he was considered to be quite the antithesis of a war god, but instead seen as a god of agriculture, one who was responsible for irrigation. But as the political structure of Mesopotamia changed and shifted to one of a more violent disposition, the necessity of a war god became more apparent. After all, the Mesopotamians relied on the gods for their everyday lives, from the weather, education, communication, trade, love, and even death. War, therefore, would become another aspect that was too overwhelming for the mortals, and thus, a deity would be invoked to not only provide protection and also offer security during these trying times, but also lead the people to both triumph and better days. How the Nurta changed from a peaceful agricultural god to a vigorous battle-hardened war god is not exactly known. But with the rise of imperialism, one god was certainly required to fill these shoes. And I suppose who better to take up this role than a son of the principal deity and head of the pantheon, Enlil. Indeed, as the son of Enlil and his wife Ninlil, Ninurta was already considered to be a deity destined for greatness, and a god who would go to considerable and large efforts for his people. Enlil, who was the very first agricultural god, and one who actively encouraged the people of Mesopotamia to farm and harvest from the earth, would conceivably pass these traits down to his son. The Sumerians in particular came up with some surprising innovations when it came to agriculture. Though these technological advancements were not claimed by the farmers who pioneered them, but were instead believed to have been given to mankind by Ninurta himself in the form of instructions. These agricultural systems that included intricate manipulation of canals, reservoirs, complex mapping, construction of tools, reading weather patterns, and even studying the ground itself, were by all means engineerial feats of greatness. So it comes as no surprise that the gods would assume responsibility for something so brilliantly genius. With this, the Farmer's Almanac, a compendium of instructions to guide the farmer through the chaotic realm of agriculture, was created. As you might imagine, the Almanac is mostly a pragmatic document, which seeks to explain how to take advantage of the land and how to produce crops that will last. It also provided information on how one might navigate through the turbulence of the seasons, how to maintain tools, and how best to harvest what one has produced. The text though, believed to have been penned somewhere between the years 1700 and 1500 before the Common Era, has a more mythological introduction and conclusion. We are told that the Almanac, despite being penned by the pioneers of ancient farming, were actually the words of Ninurta, a divine gift from the gods to mankind. But it is possible that Ninurta had a need to step out from his father's shadow, and his worshippers may have also wished to establish a more distinct realm for Ninurta to govern over, that of course being the realm of war. In other renditions, Ninurta was also believed to preside over the realm of healing, 
on the account that he was married to the goddess of healing, Gula. He was also believed to be married to another healing goddess known as Bor in Sumeria. With this, you might say that Ninurta was a dichotomous deity, much like Inanna, who dealt in both love and war. Ninurta though, may be more oxymoronic, given that he participated in warfare and promoted aggression, but was also reserved to healing the injured and demonstrating compassion. Of course, you might also say that Ninurta was selective in his healing, choosing to heal only those who had invoked him and only those whose side he had allied himself with. Of his other responsibilities, he was believed to cast magical spells to cure diseases, heal injuries, and even ward off demons. Ninurta was believed to have originated in Sumer, under the moniker of Lord of Gersu, Gersu being a town in Sumeria where he was prominently worshipped. Commonly referred to as Ningursu, after this town in Sumeria, or Publisarg in the city of Ladakh, and much later conflated with the biblical character Nimrod, Ninurta was a renowned deity, recognised throughout all of Mesopotamia and even beyond. Along with his realm of influence over warfare, Ninurta was also considered to be a hero, one who aided and encouraged men in everyday adventure, from battles to even hunting. To see such a deity was to see a warrior with metallic wings, he who wielded both a bow and a talking mace, known as Sharur. In some ancient depictions, he is seen riding upon the back of a lion who is equipped with the tail of a scorpion. The image of this creature represented Ninurta's prowess in battle, that he was able to commandeer such a frightful beast and charge it directly into the enemy. The beast itself also helped strike fear into those who saw it, for both the lion and the scorpion were recognised predators, both of which were capable of slaying man if given the chance. The beast under Ninurta's control therefore also represented Ninurta's potency in a war, and how he himself was ferocious in the face of combat. Ninurta's role within mythology is quite significant, and as a god of war, you'd be correct in assuming that many of his appearances see him in battle. In the poem known as Lugale, sometimes also referred to as the exploits of Ninurta, Ninurta is goaded by his own mace Sharur into fighting the demon Asag. Sharur who despite being a mace, was attributed with a logical personality, is seen here to hype up Ninurta by commenting on his superior strength and prowess in battle. With such flattery, he is able to encourage Ninurta into initiating conflict with Asark and ultimately battling the demon to the death. With this, you might say that it is Sharur who is the more bloodthirsty of the two, given that it is actually the mace the weapon who instigates the confrontation. Perhaps in some regard, this is Shura's nature as a weapon, a tool wishing to be used for that which it was created for. Yet Ninurta, who appeared to be initially indifferent to the conflict, is quick to be persuaded, and with the promise from Shura that the battle will be easy, Ninurta seeks out Asag. When Ninurta does find Asag, he learns that the demon was prepared to fight him. He bolstered an army of dreadful rock monsters, and had forces so numerous in number that it gave Ninurta pause. In some texts, Ninurta is even described as trying to flee, but is ultimately persuaded by Sharur to hold his ground. By reminding Ninurta of who he is, and what he has accomplished, Sharur is able to infiltrate Ninurta's psyche, and motivate him into resuming the battle. You might say that with this, Sharur acts in a similar way that Ninurta himself is believed to act towards humans, giving them what they need to engage in an upcoming conflict and promising them glory if they are brave. What's interesting is that Ninurta actually does demonstrate fear in this text, showing us a more human side to the deity. As we know, the Mesopotamian deities were not without fault, and were far from perfect infallible beings. By understanding this, 
Ninurta's worshippers may have related to the fear he demonstrated and reconciled that it was okay to be afraid so long as they pushed through and showed courage. Ninurta proceeds to single-handedly defeat Asarg and his entire stone army, but this victory came at a cost. You see, Asarg was responsible for keeping the waters of the underworld in check, and because of his destruction at the hands of Ninurta, no one was able to prevent the waters from rising to flood the land. Due to these floods, nothing could grow upon the surface, which would lead humanity into great famines, and eventually, starvation. Seeking to redeem this outcome, Ninurta decided to take the stone corpses of Asarg's army and built out of them a wall around the land. He continued to pile the corpses upon each other until eventually a great mountain had formed, which kept the primeval waters of the underworld in place. The mountain is dedicated by Ninurta to his mother, who in this text is not Ninlil but instead Ninma. With this naming, he also changes his mother's name to Ninhursark, believed to mean the Lady of the Mountain. In another famous tale, Ninurta demonstrates once again the courage a man should have when it comes to rising to new challenges. In the Epic of Anzu, Anzu, a monstrous bird, stole the Tablets of Destiny from the principal deity Enlil. The Tablets of Destiny were the most powerful and sacred tablets to possess for they not only detail the fate of every other deity, as well as allow the wielder to manipulate time itself, but they also pronounced whoever held them as the supreme ruler. The Anzu bird knew of the powers that these tablets held, and for this, he lusted for them daily, trying, but always failing, to pinch them from the hands of Enlil. But one day, when Enlil was bathing, the Anzu bird took its opportunity and with Enlil distracted, the bird swooped down and collected the tablets in its talons. With this, Enlil was effectively denounced as the supreme deity, and in his place was now the monstrous bird Anzu. Without any power to face the bird, or perhaps too ashamed to, Enlil asks the other gods for help, but none of them agree to aid him. It is only his son Ninurta who steps forward, and volunteers to bring back the tablets and to restore his father's power. Ninurta's courage should be noted here, for he is the only deity to step up and agree to this task. You might say that he had a familial obligation to, given that Enlil was his father, but the notion of fighting a monstrous bird like Anzu in the first place would have given even the most skilled warrior some pause. The fact that Ninurta opts to fight the bird whilst it is in possession of the tablets only contributes to his virtues as a fighter, warrior, and even a hero. But determination and sheer will alone was not enough to see Ninurta victorious, for not only was the bird powerful in its own right, but it also used the tablets to affect time. When Ninurta fought the bird, his arrows fell apart in midair and reverted to their base materials. The shafts were returned to the woods, the feathers returned to the birds, and the arrowheads returned to the oars. With time being used against him, Ninurta retreats, but only to gain a better vantage, where he calls upon the wind itself to assist him. The wind, seemingly unaffected by time, given that its form is constant, is used by Ninurta to rip apart Anzu's wings. When the bird tumbles out of the sky, Ninurta is quick to pounce on the monster and with a knife, cuts open its throat. Having defeated his enemy, Ninurta retrieves the Tablets of Destiny and gives them back to Enlil, restoring his father's supreme powers. But in another story, which appears to follow after the previous two narratives, we see a darker side to achieving glory and how the gods, like the humans, suffered from ambition. In the story known as Ninurta and the Turtle, pride becomes Ninurta's downfall. After having defeated the demon Asarg, and after having clipped the wings of Anzu and returning his father's tablets, Ninurta demanded more from his fellow gods 
than mere praise. Enki, the god of the waters, and a principal deity in his own right, appears to praise Ninurta one too many times, and whilst he is never disrespectful of his achievements, it might be said that either Ninurta wanted more, or that he found Enki patronising. After all, it was Ninurta and Ninurta alone who had defeated Anzu and returned the tablets, and where the other gods had cowered away from helping his father, Ninurta had borne the weight of the burden. So it's conceivable that with his success, Ninurta believed that he was better than the other gods, and that they had no right to adorn him with accolades, for he was now their superior. He explains to Enki that he thirsts for even greater glories, and that he intends to set his sights upon the whole world. Being perceptive, Enki may have read more into Ninurta's words, and seen the shift in the young god's attitude. Where he had once been brave and heroic, he would turn bitter and villainous, after having tasted the all-alluring nectar that was glory. Instead of being humbled by his experience, one might say that Ninurta was made conceited and selfish, and grew so fond of the heights of fame that it changed him into a much less savoury character. Taking precautions against Ninurta, Enki chooses to create a giant turtle that manifests behind Ninurta. The turtle then attacks Ninurta, bundling him up in its mouth and dragging him down into the earth. In this struggle, Ninurta is unable to free himself from the creature's clutches, and is forced to admit defeat. Having enjoyed the show, Enki mocks Ninurta, taunting him that if he is now so great, then surely he'd be able to defeat a turtle, of all things. The ending of the story is not known, due to the fact that the tablet it was written on is damaged, but it can be surmised that Ninurta was humbled by this defeat, and made to recognise both the error in his arrogance, and the limits of his own power, in comparison to one such as Enki. By the time of the Assyrian Empire, Ninurta's reputation as a war deity would make him a fiercely popular god. The ancient kings before the Common Era were particularly keen on Ninurta, going on to integrate his name into their own. Assyrian kings from Tukulti Ninurta, or Ninurta Tukulti Ashur, would honour the war god in abundance, and would even dedicate much of their own reigns in tribute to him. To some, Ninurta was the reason why they were in power in the first place, and it was a detail that few were willing to overlook. To some Assyrians, Ninurta was even equivalent to the principal deity Ashur. In the 9th century before the Common Era, Assyrian king Ashur Nasirpal II relocated the capital of the empire to Kalu, an ancient city now known as Nimrud in modern day Iraq. There, the first temple was built in dedication to Ninurta, and was decorated with several carvings and reliefs, those which prominently depicted the encounter between Ninurta and the Anzu bird. As shown as Sirpal II's successor, his son Salmanesir III, who also ruled in the 9th century before the Common Era, was equally devoted to Ninurta, and would go on to complete the work on Ninurta's temple that was left outstanding. One of its more notable contributions, besides any structural additions, was a stone carving he left, which speaks of his military prowess and fortune in battle, those of which he dedicated to Ninurta. By such words and actions, we are able to get a glimpse as to the Assyrian attitude towards Ninurta, and understand that he was most cherished by those in power. With such sentiments, one might argue that the king of Assyria relied upon Ninurta to crush their enemies, and that both military strategy and soldiery effort came only second to the will of the warrior god. Put simply, it didn't matter if the Assyrians were outnumbered, or even outwitted, for their warrior god Ninurta could not be defeated, and would see his people triumphant. 
This was all well and good until the times of Sargon II, or Sargon the Great, the Assyrian king who not only preferred the scribe Nabu, but valued intellect over strength. Not only this, but Sargon II moved the capital city out of Kalu, and thus so dwindled the importance of Ninurta, who was in some capacity left behind. Despite no longer being the king's favourite toy, Ninurta was far from relegated from the pantheon. Instead, he remained a most prominent essence in many of the Assyrians' life, especially given that Sargon II's rule was just as conquestile as his predecessors. War was still a major part of the Assyrians' life, and thus, so was Ninurta. In Kalu, meanwhile, Ninurta was venerated and was believed to be still residing there in his temple. The temple would see activity and worship long into the 7th century BC, before the collapse of the Assyrian Empire altogether. There, the city of Kalu, amongst many others in Assyria, was captured by the invading Persians and Medes, who would see to the physical destruction of the gods. Because deities such as Ninurta had become symbolic with the Assyrian political regime, they were torn down and destroyed with prejudice. Temples were either abandoned or straight up reduced to rubble, and with such a purge of these old gods, it stands to reason why many of them were unable to recover. Despite the eventual downfall of the gods in the wake of the Assyrian collapse, or in the favour of more monotheistic values, Ninurta and the idea of such a warrior or hero would continue to influence later mythologies and religious narratives. In the Bible, for example, it is believed that Ninurta was actually known as Nimrod, the mighty and renowned hunter, who in some beliefs not only built the Tower of Babel, but also refuted the biblical god and made war against him. To the Greeks and Romans, meanwhile, Ninurta was believed to have been one of the inspirations for Hercules, given his associations with strength, battle, courage, and heroism. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.